Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone's having a beautiful day. So last day, I had ended off asking you some questions about how we can compare different algorithms. And we came up with a list of some things that people might consider when I want to say, okay, if I have two different algorithms that may potentially solve a problem, I would like some way to say, okay, I like this algorithm over that algorithm, or there's some objective measure for doing so. We talked about a variety of them, but two I really highlighted at the end were talking about time and space, or memory usage. So some of this is going to be something you've seen in 210, again, like some previous lectures, but I'm going to kind of stack on top of it if you haven't seen some of these ideas before, which hopefully you won't mind too much. So just to, just to give you an idea what complexity means, at least a broader view of it, is just the amount of computer resources an algorithm uses. So oftentimes when we want to measure resources uh, for an algorithm, that's what we usually refer to as complexity. It's another way of talking about the difficulty for solving a problem in some other contexts. We'll maybe talk about those towards the end of this course. Um, now, two main ones, as I mentioned in my list, that of interest for us are these two resources, time and space. So time complexity is the amount of time needed by the algorithm to complete. So note the key phrase needed. Um, very often when people throw time complexity at you, the, normally the assumption is that we're talking about what we call worst case time complexity, which I'll remind you of in a little bit. Um, but there's different ways we can analyze the complexity. The other measurement uh, we're going to look at is space complexity. We're going to primarily focus on time, but space is another one that does come up when we talk about data structures is the amount of memory that an algorithm needs. So in so if I just to get a little bit technical with you for a moment. So space typically includes the input itself. So remember I talked about problem instance and I talked about the input which is the instance itself. That's usually included in the space complexity. However, for most contexts when we're studying algorithms, that part of the input is, that part of the space is not very interesting. I'll give you an example in a moment just to highlight this. So in this course, we'll focus on what we call auxiliary or extra space. So this is the space that your algorithm uses once I'm given the input. So I'm not going to count the input as part of the space I'm going to calculate. So just keep that in mind. So I'll give you one example of this. So suppose I were to consider our search problem from the other day, where we talked about linear search, for example. And also another problem that came up was uh, where we consider the special case of the search problem, where I know that the array is already sorted. Uh, so if I know it's sorted, as in all the elements are in a non-decreasing order, uh, I can use binary search, for example. Now, if I were to measure the space usage, now in both of these cases, what would be the space usage if I were to care about, uh, just if I included the input, just as a given? It would be based on, because I'm in, in the search problem, I'm given in a, an array, right? So that will be a part of the input. Yeah, so just keep in mind that all it would be is just, okay, if, I, if I'm looking at this in terms of something like big O, it would be like, okay, so the space would be at least big O of N, because that's part of the input I'm given. Now, in different contexts, if I wanted to look at this and ask questions about, okay, so what, how much usage of memory is there for the algorithm itself? Now, if I were to use linear search, for example, notice that if I were to go back to my linear search algorithm, the only things I did was introduce some variables, which all of those take a constant amount of space up, right? So if I were to measure that, you would tell me that the space complexity, or in our case, the auxiliary or extra space used is big O of one, a uh, constant amount of space. So well, I'll talk all about big O and stuff in the upcoming lectures, but uh, I just want to give you a flavor for this. Now, in contrast, if I wanted to, say, for example, I wanted to use binary search. Now, naturally, if I were assuming I consider that special case where the input is, for example, sorted already, uh, I don't have to worry so much about a sorting algorithm. However, imagine if I wanted the input to be sorted. That would be, then I'm at the mercy of a sorting algorithm. And depending on which sorting algorithm I pick, 
that will change how much space usage I, I, I use. Uh, so for example, uh, if I, for example, use a, a sorting algorithm that actually uses an extra array, for example, then what happens is I'm actually using more space. This extra space would go up. If I require an extra array, for example, say I copy all my elements to another array, some versions of merge sort, for example, will do this. Um, then, for example, I would, be, I would tell you that the space usage would be big O of n as opposed to big O of 1. If I needed to sort it for that extra space, if I'm, by out, I'm at the mercy of the sorting algorithm. Some of them will have it where the, the extra space usage is constant. Other ones will require more space. We'll talk more about that when we talk about one of our applications for sorting. We get to talking about heaps later on in this course. But the big point I want to get at is that that we're going to care about what the algorithm actually uses for its space, not just the input. So we'll just ignore the input. We'll look more about this space usage from the algorithm itself. Is that clear, everybody? The reason why is because most of the time when we're actually looking at the space measurement, especially when we're dealing with very delicate problems where we want to solve the problem in less time than linear, and if the size of the input is linear, then we often will have not very much of useful discussion if we're talking about the space complexity if the input is linear, if I really care about whether it doesn't use any extra space or not. So are there any questions about that? I just want to make sure I'm clear about this, is that Technically, space complexity includes the initial input, so the instance itself plus all the space you use for your algorithm. But in this course, we'll just use space complexity to mean extra space usage or auxiliary space. Whenever it's unclear, I will tell you straight up. Okay, so if we're, first, are we okay with this? Tell me two thumbs up if we're all good to go. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so now this is the next thing. Now, a lot of the time I find that uh, students aren't really shown kind of like the pipeline, what I, I would call it like a pipeline or a process for analyzing an algorithm. Now, the first thing you got to think about is what you're measuring. So for example, what are we measuring from a complexity standpoint? So if we're measuring the time complexity, then what we need is we have, to, we imagine we're given some algorithm and I want to analyze its time complexity. Now, the way I would like to do this, at least in this course, is I would like to derive what we're going to call a complexity function. So we need to measure this complexity in some way. So this requires me deriving what we're going to call a complexity or growth function. You'll find that I'll call it a complexity function almost all the time. But in other contexts, calling it a growth function is rather useful because Often the context when we actually look at these functions, we care about when the inputs tend to get large. Hence why the word growth, we're talking about growth rates. So these functions, uh, normally when we cast these, we're talking about a function that's in the size of the input. So the input for this function would be the size of the input. Hence why we talked about input size the other day. So, one thing I also want to point out, this is more of a technical thing. Um, I will assume that the functions are on a domain of positive integers to non-negative real numbers. So for those that are savvy with mapping notation for functions, if I call the function f, what I'm saying is I give you some number like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, just for sake of clarity for everybody in case you're not familiar with this notate notation. Uh, the blackboard Z here, this means this is the set of all integers. Uh, the blackboard R, this is the set of all real numbers. So this was your, these are typical counting numbers, including zero and the negative integers. So when I give you Z plus, with a plus like this, you could assume that I'm meaning the numbers one, two, three, four, and so on. These are your positive integers. So I, I include a little subscript just to indicate here that I'm talking about. So this function will spit out. So for each one of one, two, three, four, all the way up, 
it'll spit out some value or whatever the smallest value I need for this. We'll spit out some number that's between zero and other, some other finite number. And it, it could be a real number. So is that clear, everybody? So we'll see plenty of complexity functions in this course. One other remark I do want to make is that in some circles, when they study complexity functions, they make certain assumptions about what this function will look like. Almost always when you run into these kind of functions, they have a special property that is called eventually non-decreasing. That means the function will typically have a shape that will look something like this. So, so if I were to plot it out, typically it will look something like where it might, it might veer a little bit like this, but it might plateau and then it starts rising. So the eventually part means that at some point it becomes a non-decreasing function. So it could be here. Uh, I think technically it's right here. This is the first point for which that happens. So for example, all increasing functions, eventually non-decreasing. But I'll talk more about those specific details if we ever need to talk about it. There will be a point later on in the course where that might be more relevant. You might ask, why is this the case? Well, typically when we analyze our algorithms, it's not that the running time just veers around all over the place. When I derive one of these functions, it typically will steadily increase. But there will be some point where it's just going to eventually just stay going up or it'll stay about the same time. But that's just more of a remark. If you're not sure so much about that, don't worry. We'll talk all about those kinds of functions later on in the course, okay? So anyways, so once I have the algorithm, I need, I need to think about how I derive one of these complexity functions based on whatever resource I want to measure the running time by. That brings me to talking about how we do that. So how do exactly do we come up with this complexity function is based on a type of analysis. So what we do is we identify certain scenarios which define a set of instances, each of their own size, so that when I measure each one of these sizes for an instance, and keep in mind there can be infinitely many of these, I measure each of them. And each of them, with respect to the input size, has a certain complexity. And I would like to have a function that derives this. So, so I look at the algorithm, and I look through that prism of this analysis. And then what I do is I count up all the operations that are going to happen. So, so what do I mean by this? So here's the first example. This is one of the ones that you may be shown before, you may not have been. Um, but you can think of this as a best case analysis where you have a best case scenario and here's the idea. Now you might find this definition rather unsatisfactory because it's sort of circular in its own way. <laughs> um, but the example will illustrate this quite quickly. So you might ask, okay, uh, so analysis of the algorithm using a best problem instance. So the goal when we use this type of analysis is to identify instances or even just an instance that will define an infinite set of instances so that when I were to look at it, this is going to cause the algorithm for any input of size n, for example, that it will cause the best case behavior of the algorithm, meaning it's going to have the least number of operations happen with respect to the input. So just as an example, uh, let me just do an example. Let's talk about linear search, because last day we talked about linear search. So for example, if I consider a linear search, so I have a question for you. What would be a best case scenario for linear search? What causes the number of operations that are going to happen with linear search to be as few as possible? Yeah, I see it in the chat. So it's so if you have it where the key that you're looking for is in fact the first element, right? Then you boom, you get a match, you could return right away. That's perfect, perfect. So in this case, so you can define a, a whole class of instances that all match that scenario. So usually what will happen is you, you introduce some scenario that is going to be the one which causes that behavior to happen. And then what we do is we measure the number of operations that happen in that scenario. So best case instances are those, are those where x 
is the first element is the first element the first element that that m sort of melted into the e here is the first element uh, considered in the array considered in the array so in this case this just requires one comparison right Let me switch my marker. This one's being a little squeaky. So this, this case, you might say, OK, Dan, if I go back to my definition of time complexity, is this one a rather ins insightful case for me to consider? Question for everybody. Is this a rather insightful case, like this best case analysis? So. You might say it's not, it, it is an optimistic scenario, right? It's the most optimistic one. Um, so you might say, Dan, if I'm talking about the time complexity, the amount of time needed for the algorithm to run, it's not very insightful in that sense because it doesn't tell me how much time is needed by the algorithm for all problem instances. It only tells me how quickly the algorithm could terminate in finite time, right? at least with respect to the input. So a lot of people, when they talk to you about time complexity, normally they don't look at this case unless it's actually relevant. Uh, so for example, if you really care about that, there's this very easy way for the algorithm to terminate quickly, this might be interesting. But for us, you're going to find that in many situations, the best case analysis isn't going to give us very much insight for the time complexity or the space complexity. But I just feel like it's necessary for me to mention that. So are there any questions about best case analysis? Just think of it as the best case scenario. So when you're, when you're the person sitting down and developing the algorithm or designing or discovering one, when, you, when you're trying to determine this, your job is to identify the cases going to cause the least number of operations to happen with respect to the input size. So think of it as best case, best case, as the name suggests. So another situation I want you to be aware of it's called average case analysis. Now, I'm not sure if you've seen this before. If not, that's OK, too. I'm just going to switch my marker again, just for dramatic purposes. So average case analysis, as the name would suggest, you can think of this as on average. That's, this is the easiest way I could, I could describe it to you. In quotation marks, it's on average. Now, let me give you a proper definition for average case analysis. The analysis uh, using, using, using all the problem instances, problem instances, of a given problem, of a given problem, over some probability distribution. So, you might ask, Dan, what does that mean? So I'm going to introduce you to the most common scenario where you're going to see average case analysis. It's, so I'm just going to give you an example here. Um, example, when all outcomes, well, all outcomes are equally likely. So this says when all outcomes are equally likely. So meaning that the probability that each one of these things could happen is it's uniform. So usually that's what you're going to run into in practice is when somebody presents you an average case analysis, usually they'll tell you, usually, usually it's over a uniform distribution. So I'm just going to give you an idea. Now I'm going to put more of the details in the notes. So I'm going to ask you to take a peek at this. 
But I want to give you kind of a sketch of how this plays out with something like linear search. So just to give you just an example of this. So if you, it's been a while for you for statistics, that's okay. I do have in the notes a proper definition of like expected value and so on. Uh, so if it's been a little while, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. Um, I must stress that average case analysis uh, 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 requires a bit of in that sense, it is a little trickier to do than the other case analysis that I will be focusing more on in this course. So just to give you a flavor for this, um, just to give you an idea, I want to give you this sketch of the idea and then I'll kind of describe it in words for you. Then I'll give you all the details in the notes, okay? Just as for example, for linear search. So here's the idea. Here's an idea of how to do this. You compute, you compute the average number, the average number of steps performed of all possible of all possible instances of a given uh, all problem instances. Ah, let's, let me just change this one small detail. My apologies, everybody. Let me just, let's just, I have one small detail I wanted to add in here. All possible instances over the probability distribution where each each instance each instance is assigned assigned a probability, a probability of occurring. So here's the idea. So you decide on the, the probability distribution. So for example, if you want to consider a linear, like our, our search problem, and you want to consider instances where you know that the key exists in the array, and if it does, it ha happens with equal probability for which it could exist in the first spot, it could exist in the second spot, in the third spot, the fourth spot, the fifth spot, the sixth, all the way up to the end. I can assume that if the length of the array, say for example, is n, the way this step would work is that I assume that there's going to be, so if I take all those instances that I've just assumed exist, so keep in mind, I am excluding instances when I do this. So what do I mean? So if I consider the search problem where the key exists in the array. So if I assume all of those, so imagine that's this circle here. There's a whole bunch of instances in here. I'm going to assign a probability for each subset of these instances. So I'm going to split them up into a whole bunch of chunks here, each with their own instances. So this is where the, so where the first position has X, the second position has X, the third position has X, all the way up to position, uh, I'll say the last position as x. So I'm splitting them up into all these instances and each one I assign a probability for it to happen. 
So in this case, what I'm telling you is if I use a uniform distribution, what I'm telling you is that I'm going to assign a probability of these happening to 1 over n, where n is the length of the array. So the way this would work is that you would identify all of these, figure out the probability for it to happen, which we have right here. And all you do is you compute what we call the, exp the, the expected value. Or in our case, this will be a simple average calculation. So I'm going to give you an idea of this in the notes. So I'm going to ask you to see the notes for the example, just for the purposes of time here. So with all this information you, you compute, um, uh, the expected value. So for example, with linear search, if you were to do this process, you end up actually showing that in the average case, that it still runs in big O of n time. Or you still have to do some number of comparisons. It's roughly half. Which, if you think about it, it's rather intuitive if you actually think about it. Because if you have all of the instances, if you have all the instances from happening here, if I were to assume that they're all equally likely to happen on random, you would assume it's somewhere probably about the middle, at least intuitively speaking. So it's roughly half. You can see the calculation in the notes. Now, I must stress that I am technically restricting my instances by my probability distribution. Notice that I'm saying the first position has x, the second one has x, the third has x, and the last one has x. So it means I'm not making a consideration for another scenario, the one for which x isn't in any of them. Um, but here's the one thing I want to point out about that, is that when you have to consider the last position anyways, it may as well be no different than if it didn't exist, right? Because you'd have to scan through all the elements anyways. Do you see what I mean? Because if I scan through all of the elements, you, I, I know in the back of your mind, when I get to worst case analysis, you're going to tell me that you have to look at all the elements first, right? So for a lot of practical purposes, you might be able to get away with just not considering another circumstance, which I must stress you can do. It just makes the statistical calculation a little bit more complicated. Okay, so the whole idea here is you identify a set of instances that you want to analyze. You assign a probability for each of those instances for them to occur. Like in my example here, I assume that all of these instances have a probability of 1 over n, um, a uniform distribution. And all I do is I compute this thing called the expected value, which you might know it as the average. It's a much more general calculation. But anyways, I'll ask you to take a look at this example in the notes. You won't find me talking much about average case analysis in this course. So for those that haven't seen lots of stats before, don't worry. I'm not going to be talking a whole lot about it. I might throw it at you more as just a factoid, unless it's really relevant for me to dig into it, OK? So with that being said, are there any questions about that? So just, just keep in mind that this is just overall probability distribution. So some people might decide, instead of using a uniform distribution, they might use a different kind of distribution. So for example, if they know, for example, uh, say they have some information in advance. For example, they know that the key most likely will occur somewhere in the middle. What you could do is you could actually pick up a, st a, a probability distribution that may look more like a bell curve, for example. And if you have that information, that actually can help you find it easier, right? This kind of information is often useful. That's why average case analysis tends to be rather useful in that sense. But like I said, it's more complicated because now you have to split up all these instances into different classes, like these, bo these bubbles here, and you have to calculate a probability out for each of them. But anyways, that's not really the one I want to focus on in this course. In this course, we're going to focus primarily on worst case analysis. Now this one you may have seen in 2.10, I at least I would hope so. Um, so this is where you just analyze in the worst case scenario. So 
So this is where we're using what I'm going to colloquially refer to as worst problem instances. So, so first, question for the chat or everybody. Has everybody seen worst case analysis before? If you haven't, please tell me so I know what pace I should be going at with this subject. Okay. So it seems like I'm seeing no no's or anything. But that's okay. I'm going to be going over this topic anyways, but I'm just I just want to get kind of gauge where everybody is at. That, that's okay. That's okay. We'll talk about this, okay? I just want to make sure everybody's cut up the speed. So So let's talk about worst case analysis. Now, under the exact same rationale that I gave you earlier, worst case analysis is where we're going to identify a scenario which defines a whole set of instances which the algorithm runs as long as possible with respect to the input size. So that's going to be our goal with worst case analysis. So I'm going to say this type of analysis, this type of analysis, that's an S. It looks kind of like an F. Let me fix that. This type of analysis gives us a bound, a bound on the complexity, on the complexity of an algorithm in the worst case scenario. Scenario. Now, here's the most important part about this, and this is why people will point to worst case analysis as one of the ones that you really want to know about. The algorithm will never run longer run longer than in than in the worst in the worst case so this is the thing i want you to remember when somebody points to you and says okay well why does worst case analysis really matter So somebody's already coming up with ideas on how to do this with linear search. We're going to talk about that in one moment. But remember, this is the thing I want you to really remember about this. Is when I tell you that I, require, I want to know how much the algorithm requires in terms of time, worst case analysis is a natural way of characterizing this. That's why. So if somebody like me comes along and says, hey, look, I ask you on the exam or something, this, this is what I'm looking for. Just to give you a clear, transparent view of this. So you can even star that if, I, if, it, if it's something that you need, need to remind yourself of. You may have seen this before. So just as our example, um, uh, it was suggested in the chat, um, but I'll go even simpler than this. If I were considering linear search, so I'm just going to abbreviate linear search with ls. Um, in this situation, it's when x is not in l. Where, remember, l is our array. And this requires n comparisons. So another way you can also characterize this as well is you can always say it's in the last position too. That's also an acceptable way of characterizing the worst case scenario because you have to scan through all the elements anyways. <laughs> um, to find the last one, but most certainly this is the more natural way of thinking about it. You'll find very often if we're looking or searching for things, the worst case scenario tends to be this one. <laughs> um, so, ah, so this is an interesting question in the chat. Let me just, just want to just take a quick peek at that. Let me just take a quick peek at that. Uh, 
Ah, so I'm actually going to talk just, I'm actually going to talk literally about that. So uh, the question was about uh, computer use, like computer, uh, computer based specifications about issues around, for example, the CPU, over usage, network lag, and things like that. Believe it or not, when we actually analyze these algorithms in themselves, we never actually have to take a look and, and consider these things. However, when you want to actually do an experiment with these, these are things that you would want to take into account. But you're going to find that in this course, we're going to spend a lot of time focusing on just the algorithms themselves. So we'll find that in this course, we're going to focus on this worst case analysis. But I'm going to, I'm going to, dev actually, you're going right to where I want to go next, right after this. Uh, in this course, we'll focus on worst case analysis. So just to remember, give you a big picture view of everything. So somebody gives you an algorithm. Now, it may be correct or may be incorrect. This is where you want to determine if it's correct or incorrect. So you try to either prove that it's correct or you find a counterexample, show it's wrong. Once you've figured out, oh yeah, no, this tends to work pretty, like it seems to work. Um, or you have an intuition about it, you want to determine its resources, what it needs. So what somebody comes along and says, okay, so how am I going to measure what the algorithm's requirements are for time? Well, if I use worst case analysis, what I would do is identify where the algorithm takes its longest. So I identify a scenario. This will define a set of instances. And all I do is I count, I'm going to count all these operations, but I need some way of doing that, right? <laughs> it's not very clear at this stage how I'm supposed to do this. <laughs> um, some of you may have some ideas from 2.10. I'm going to kind of formalize it a little further. If you've seen how to count operations where you count up the steps and stuff, we're going to do that again here in this course. But I'm going to be a little bit more careful about it. Is that clear, everybody? So once I have this complexity function, then I'm going to try to classify the problem based on how efficiently I could solve it. Or just naturally, I have two algorithms. I want to know which one is faster for the whole set of instances. That's usually the latter is the one we're going to focus on at this stage. Towards the end of the course, we'll talk more about the first way of thinking about it, where we classify problems based on their efficiencies of how many reasons, how much, what's their complexities. So. Let's talk a little bit about this. So you might ask, Dan, how do you take into account all those things that like computer based specifications? So I must stress that to measure complexity, we need a clock of some kind. We need some way to actually measure those operations or how long it takes, right? Now, there's different ways you could do this, right? If you're doing an actual computer, you can actually like you can actually time out how long the execution of your function, for example, is if it's an implementation of your algorithm. Like you can sit there, make a stopwatch, you can start it, and then you can measure how long it takes, and then it completes. And you do this for many, many instances, and you measure out how long it takes. That's one way of doing this, right? And you may control for certain things, or you may do some, some setup for this to ensure that you're measuring in a way that is accurate, right? You aren't just picking off all the best case scenario ca instances and just saying, hey, look, that's the complexity of my algorithm. Usually that doesn't fly very well. <laughs> so that's why it's really important to identify the worst case scenario, because you could think of these almost like benchmark cases. So where you want to say, OK, how long can this possibly take? If you have the intuition around worst case analysis, then that gives you an idea of how long this could take, the nasty instances. So if you, so that's one insight that's actually really helpful. It's not just about determining how long it's going to take, but it also gives you an insight into how long that algorithm will, like it gives you figure out where the bottlenecks of your algorithms are. Uh, that's actually one matter of intuition in practice. So if you find yourself looking at your algorithm and like, okay, in these instances here, they cause a lot of problems. So maybe I should use a different algorithm in those cases. Uh, so this is often very helpful in practice as well. So just to give you an idea of this, just to, so I have to, by obligation, I need to talk about experimental approaches first. 
before I talk about this. So I need some way of measuring how long things take. Of, so experimental way of measuring uh, time complexity, just as an example, you could do this with space as well. Measuring time complexity might need so I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to wean you in a certain direction. So if you're ever just like, Dan, I don't agree with you on that. Please push back on me. I'm very happy to talk about this kind of stuff. So, so presumably I'm going to need a computer to do the experiment, right? Some computer. I don't know what it is. It could be my dog. I don't know. <laughs> it's some computer. <laughs> um, I'm going to need a computer. Typically, a computer that the ones that we like to use typically have an operating system for which you write, you have your programs written within the confines of, usually, which governs the rules for which your functions on the most fundamental level of software tend to operate, where they interface with your hardware, right? So you're going to have an operating system, and you're naturally going to need probably a compiler for this, right? You're not going to be writing your, your algorithm out in pure machine code, right? <laughs> Uh, you're going to need, you're probably going to need a compiler, uh, probably. Unless you're just that nitpicky about getting down to that lowest level. Um, but I want to point out, so when you do this, like I said, you would time out every one of your instances. So you would select a whole collection of instances. You can time them on your computer with a stop and a start. You probably did an exercise like this in 2.10, for example. Um, for example, for the lab, I think. I can't remember off the top of my head. Where you just time it with your algorithms, you try with different sizes of instances, and you identify, depending on what your goal is with your experiment, how long it's going to take. For example, if you want to identify a distribution of instances, like my average case analysis, you can do that. If you want to do worst case, and you want to identify those cases that cause bottlenecks for your performance, that's a good thing to do, right? But I want to kind of wean you in a certain direction, just to be honest. Uh, yes, uh, you, you might actually do more memory too. That's also another thing I didn't conclude here. Especially for large scale experiments, you might need more memory, right? Uh, you might need quite a bit of memory. But the great thing about this is that uh, I, I'm going to come back to this phrase later on in this course, but it's a rather important one from a complexity standpoint. Okay, time you can't reuse time, but space you can reuse, right? So this will be something that's going to be a theme towards the end of this course, but sometimes it will come up every once in a while. So when you think about memory, memory in the context of time versus space is cheap, at least from our standpoint. It, there was a time where that was not true. Uh, space used to be rather expensive. People used to have to lift hard drives onto things that are equi equivalent to about the size of a school bus. <laughs> That's, it's not like that these days, but most certainly the scale or magnitudes of those things have changed. But here's what I really want to talk about. It's more of the drawbacks of this approach, just because with sufficient programming ability, you can do this, right? You can, you can sit there and time out all these instances, just use your standard kind of like C++ libraries, or if you're using a different language, they all typically have timing libraries. But this is, first, it is time consuming and, ex and expensive to do. And I mean that just in the sense that, well, one, it does take time, which is costly. And it also depends on the inputs selected. So for example, if I pick, like remember, like I said, you have to sample some set of instances. You can't just run an infinite number of instances, right? That's not going to happen in finite time, at least in our framework. It just doesn't work. <laughs> so you're going to have to pick what you're going to experiment over, which that in itself is a type of limitation you have to be aware of. And the other thing is that, and this is sometimes not talked enough about, is that when you pin down a particular implementation of an algorithm, it's tethered to that implementation. I would like some way of naturally talking about the algorithm regardless of what programming language you use and what the specs of your computer are. 
So results depend on a particular, a particular implementation, a particular implementation. And the, and the machine uh, and the machine, the results are timed on. Because remember, the whole idea is I'm going to have some clock. I want to have some way of measuring this resource, whether it be a phys like a clock thinking in terms of time or how much memory I use. So I have a question for you. Is this, if I were to, like based on what I just kind of said right here, would you say that an experimental approach is machine dependent or machine independent? So just remember, if, if I require to run this on a specific computer with a specific operating system, with a specific compiler that will compile that code, and then on top of that, the timings of my results may depend on that computer. Is that machine dependent or machine independent? It's dependent, right? It, so, so, that, so that's one thing that I want to stress here. So that is one drawback you have to take into consideration when you do an experiment is that ultimately your study or work is going to be dependent on a single computer or whichever computers you've run it to. Ah, okay, so let's see here. So, so if, we, if we're doing this, we would like some way of doing this in a machine independent manner. So, so you can do this, most certainly. But I'm going to wean you towards trying to figure out how we can do this in a machine independent manner so that it doesn't matter if you use a computer from right now to 10 years from now. It doesn't matter if it's 20 years from now. It's just going to be independent of a machine in this sense, in the sense that I talked about over here. I would like to talk about the algorithm itself. And I need some way of doing that without tethering to one computer. <laughs> So that's where we're going to kind of go with this. So I want to just stress that you're going to find that I'm going to make a lot of simplifications that are going to sound really like when you took, think about things in this consideration, yeah, most certainly these are things you'd have to look at, like very specific things involving your system. But most certainly, if I want to look at the algorithm itself, I would like some way to do this so that I'm not bothering with these dependent details. But I would like it also to be written in a way so that if I want to add those kind of things into my model, I can do it. Does everybody get the general gist? So I'm going to give you a more abstract way of looking at how we can analyze the algorithm by introducing a what we call a model of computation. And what we're going to do is we're just to give you a kind of a, a stress call with this is we do not count actual CPU cycles or actual memory usage. That's going to be the first thing you're going to realize very quickly. It's going to be kind of weird at first. But remember, my goal is to analyze the algorithm itself We want to analyze the algorithm itself. So let's, let's move on over here. And I want to talk about, just have a brief discussion about models of computation. Because this is one thing that does, it is a rather important aspect of analysis of algorithms. Um, this is just going to be based on one model of computation. But most certainly, there's many different models of computation that exist. I'll talk more about that in a moment. OK. So I must stress that it's very tricky to count things based on it. And it, if I use a model that is very specific to a specific meat machine, um, and it can be tricky. So I'm going to say in analysis, 
we assume a particular a particular model of computation. So I'm going to describe what that is. So, so just to make sure it's clear what a model of computation is. And I'm going to stress that I could go very deep into this subject. I could go really nitty gritty with this. And I'm hoping I'm going to give you some intuition. Say, for example, you're not like, okay, Dan bringing up that, that dreaded M word, the mayonnaise and stuff. And I really like systems, for example. Like, say, say you're a student like that. I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to motivate you to why we might use this approach with my upcoming example. Just to give you a flavor for why we would do it this way as opposed to just timing it all the time like that. Um, so this is just a, a formal model, model, a formal model that describes describes computation uh, sorry as as an abstract machine and this is an abstract computational machine if you need to be a bit more specific about it um, that has a set of rules a set of rules for how how the model computes instructions uh, instructions when executing an algorithm. So if you're wondering about these things, these model of computations, now here's the natural idea. If I have a problem where everything's tethered to one computer, uh, like my computer for example, or, or like maybe your computer, the one you're watching this on probably, here's the idea. You use abstraction. <laughs> instead, instead of just thinking about your computer or my computer or something, we come up with a model that represents all computers that are equivalently capable of computing the things that we're interested in. Now, I'm not going to be able to go into a lot of the details behind what exactly is a model of computation in the sense of what exactly computers are capable of. Uh, that would be something that uh, if you've taken something like CS411 or if you plan to take that course, we talk a lot about this kind of stuff in that course. It's rather useful. <laughs> um, so let's think about this. So there's several, I must stress that there are, that there are several, and I mean like hundreds, like there are several models of computation. Or in fact, if you find a model is insufficient for what you needed to do, you can add more to it. It's just a model, right? But there's certain models that have been rather successful at capturing complexity for computers versus other ones. Um, or at least the computers that are sequentially based, for example, or parallel algorithms or other things like that. Uh, there are several, that's an E right there, several models of computation. And I must stress there's many different ones. Uh, just for an example, uh, the one that we're going to be focused in on this course is what we call the RAM model, uh, which is called the uh, random access uh, machine. Uh, so this is the what we call the RAM model. This is the one we're going to use in this course. It's very similar to a generally working computer that you're familiar with. In fact, the formalism of it is very similar to assembly. So if you were actually to go look into the literature and be like, okay, what is this RAM model that, that, that Dan's talking about? If you look at it, it will, it will remind you a lot of if you take a systems class that has assembly in it, like where you have load, you have registers and stuff. The RAM model is very much like this. So it's very similar to the idea. It has a natural kind of counterpart in actual systems. So it's not like it's some weird thing that's out of the ether, just to be very clear. 
But I'm not going to talk so much about those details here. I'm going to talk more about the rules that we would use for this RAM model for analysis. And some of these you may actually be familiar with. You may have seen them in 2.10. Um, but I'm going to kind of go a little further than this. But I'll give you some other examples of models of computation. Um, there's such things called counter machines. Uh, these involve counters. Uh, different, some of these are actually classes that are related to the RAM model. Uh, there's something called a pointer machine. And you might ask, Dan, what are all these? Don't worry. I'm just giving these as examples just to kind of like give you, give you an idea that there exists lots of these. Um, and if you take a class like CS411, you might know about, uh, you might hear about Turing machines, which is often considered the standard model for computation. Um, if you want to learn more about that, take CS411. It, there's a, it's quite, it, we, get, we have a lot of fun in that kind of class where we de de describe algorithms for this very simple machine that has like an infinite tape and it has a read right head and we move things left to the right on the tape by reading off tape cells that represent memory. It's, it's really, a, it's, it's a fun time. But yeah, no, so I just want to give you a flavor that there exists many of these. So what happens is when we want to measure complexity, we pick a model that's appropriate for what we're trying to study. So in our case, if we're trying to study general computing on like a physical computer that does sequential computing very often, the RAM model is a very appropriate one for this. It matches pretty closely what you would expect a computer to do. Um, I must stress that if we wanted to use a different kind of computer architecture, for example, this is pretty natural for sequential computing. However, if there, ex there do exist other models of computation for other computer architectures. For example, if you're interested in something called parallel computing, where we have parallel processors that all execute simultaneously, there actually exists a parallel version of this model of computation called the PRAM model. The P stands for parallel. But I just want to give you a flavor for this. Does everybody get the general gist? So when we figure out what this clock is for our measurement of operations, we select a model of computation that's going to be where we're going to follow its rules. So we follow the rules of the model. <laughs> so for example, if I, if I decide that the model that I want to measure efficiency over is a Turing machine, I have to follow the rules of what the computations of a Turing machine are. If I pick a counter machine, I have to follow the rules of that model. Just like if I have an actual computer, when I measure out the time it takes, I've, I'm measuring it based on how the uh, computer actually executes things. Just, it's no different. Except now I have a completely machine independent way of doing it because this model characterizes, like I'm not going to go into those details here, but these models of computation do capture, in fact, all possible types of computation. But, um, but anyways, we're going to use this one. So we're going to use use this RAM model. And I want to just kind of quickly go through some of the rules it has, just, just so everybody's on the same footing. So I'm going to go over to this board over here. So while I'm going over to this board, I'm going to make a remark that a lot of the rules I'm going to describe to you are for the most general form of the RAM model. There, are, there do exist very specific versions of the RAM model where you actually take into consideration very specific details that maybe somebody might say, hey, look, I want to make sure I take into account the sizes of the numbers so that when I come along and say, OK, well, what if my numbers are really, really big or something? I want to be able to take into account how long it actually takes me to read that number or things like that. So for example, I may want to restrict the sizes of the registers, for example, of my computer. These are things you can add into the RAM model. So just to be clear, there exist families of these RAM machine models. And they all, if you need to go down more and whittle this down more specifically, they do exist. Um, we're just going to use a simple version of this RAM model. And it typically is it's good enough. And most people, if you were to look into algorithms and study algorithms, this is typically the way that it's done. Okay, So just to just give you a little FYI on this. So, so here are some, that's an M, so here, is our, here are some assumptions. Here are some assumptions we can make under, I'll say under the RAM model. 
So this is our general simplified RAM model. I'm going to assume that each, so I'm going to assume the existence of things such as what we're going to call primitive or simple operations. So I'm going to tell you what these are. So each simple or primitive operation, operation takes a constant constant amount of time or operation so operations that that s is supposed to go right here but i ran out of space so a constant number of time or operation so i'm going to assume it takes some constant number of operations typically this matches what happens with hardware in the first place but just the operations you decide are simple, that's where things can veer differently. Um, you'll find very often, based on some things you may know about big O notation or things that we will see. Uh, so I'll say we will often treat these as one step. So you may have seen this, for example, in 2.10, where if you have a simplified model where you just count the operations, like you literally just count them. This, this is perfectly functional within this, this system, okay? But you'll see that I'm just going to assume it takes some constant number of operations. So just if you're not sure what constant means in this sense, constant means independent of the input size. So when I do, for example, I'm going to tell you that addition is going to be an example of a primitive operation in this model. I can, for example, I can hypothetically propose to you a model of the RAM where addition or multiplication, for example, aren't primitive operations. Typically, addition is, but they may say multiplication isn't because it's comprised of several addition operations. But my point here is that we're going to assume that these simple operations do exist. And I'm going to say such operations, such operations assumed are comparisons, uh, return statement, uh, Boolean operators. And just to be clear about co comparisons, uh, I'm talking about like less than, greater than, let greater or equal, and so on. So things I'm going to assume are like assignment, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, less than, greater than, equals, less than or equal, greater than or equal, not equals. I'm going to assume all these as simple or primitive operations. So. So these are going to be our simple or primitive operations. So most things that you'll consider kind of like the elementary parts of your program, they're typically going to be simple or primitive operations. Just to be clear, subroutines. So for example, if you have an algorithm that calls a subroutine or another function, for example, that's not a simple operation. The invocation of it is, but the actual execution of the subroutine is not. So subroutines and loops are not simple. Are not simple. Why? Because they're they comprised of many simple or primitive operations, right? And for memory accesses. Each memory access takes a constant number of steps. You can even think of it as just a single step. For most analysis that we're doing, you may as well. It doesn't make much of a difference. And I'm also going to assume that our model is capable of having as much memory as it needs. So you're not going to run out of memory on this computer, OK? We have as much memory as needed.
Now I must stress that a lot of these things are assumptions that I'm making about the computer. So when I have my RAM model, when I do these analyses, you might say, okay, so how does this translate to an actual physical computer? Because I'm making certain assumptions about these operations, right? Um, now, naturally, the RAM model has been very successful at capturing these aspects of a sequential computer. In fact, it's a very successful model. It's in fact, it's so common that if you were to go through any CS school, they'll typically show you it. That's, that's why. Um, so, I want to stress that when we, when we want to look at the complexity of a physical computer system, we're often wanting to be looking at it from the standpoint of how many operations are going to happen. And keep in mind, these operations can vary in their actual speed on a physical computer. We don't want to tether our results to those specifications because that depends on that computer. We want to know about the algorithm itself. So that's why you'll see that these, these rules are rather straightforward or simple. You may have seen them in 2.10. I'm just giving it another name on top of it. So let's talk a little bit about analyses. So let me just walk on over this way. I'm just going to do an example. I'm also going to give you another example in the notes uh, where, we, where I'm going to get you to see how you would apply this approach with insertion sort, which I know you've seen before. So I'm going to just, just to make sure everybody's on the same footing, I'm going to do one example here with worst case analysis uh, with linear search. And that'll be basically where we're going to stop for today when we get through that. So let's return to linear search. Uh, so I'm going to say, let us return to linear search. And remember, if I look at my linear search, so I'm just going to reiterate what I have here for linear search. So remember, we have linear search. So this is just the pseudocode I gave you the other day. Linear search. I have the array. I have its length. And I have some key. So I have the algorithm. It has inputs. It has output. And then I gave you an algorithm where I had I made the assignment of 0 to i, then I had my while loop. So this is the same thing we had from the other day. I just want to make sure I kind of draw this out for you. So if I assign i to be i plus 1, and when the while loop is finished, I check if i is equal to n. And if it's equal to n, that means I went through all the elements. And otherwise, I return the position. So this is the one I had from the other day, right? So what I can do is I can go through all of these lines and I can count, I can count the operations. So here's line one, line two, line three, line four, and line five. I'm going to make myself a little table over here. I'm hoping I can motivate this. I only got a couple more minutes, so let me just let's uh, let me just draw this out. So let me see. I should, yeah, okay, good. I got enough space. So I'm gonna make a table. I'm gonna do it by line, but keep in mind it doesn't have to be by line. As I'm going to show in the notes, so you can take a look at this in the notes. Um, you can even count the operations themselves. So if you want to count up all the addition operations, all the assignments, all of those separately, you can do that and actually doesn't affect the result at all. Uh, so the first column is going to be the line. The second column is going to be the number of times it's executed. And the third column is going to represent the total time. So I have line one, line two, line three. So I have line one, line two, line three, line four, and line five. Now, we just look at each of these lines and I see how many times it executes. I'm going to show you that we can just add up all these operations. And normally, that's how we get the complexity function. So one way you could do it is by literally just counting all of the operations. So you'll find in this course, I'll often cluster together operations 
such as things in loops, or I will identify a line that happens more often than every other line and count how many times that happens because that will typically dominate the running time of the whole thing. So in this first case, I do an assignment. It only executes once, right? I assign i to be 0. In the worst case, I have to go through all the elements, right? Now, when do I exit out of this loop? It's when, if, they, if none of them are going to be equal to x, then I know that this happens, but it happens when I check if i is less than n, and it's actually false. That happens when i is actually n plus 1. Sorry, when it's n. When it's n. My apologies. When it's n, but we start at 0. That means we're actually going to be executing this one extra time on that condition. So very often you'll find that I'll typically count what's inside the loop as opposed to the condition itself because you have this one extra check that happens on the while loop before you can exit out of the loop. Um, and then I have, this happens n times, right? I go through each one of the elements in the array. This happens once, that happens once, and I can associate each of these operations that happens with some constant number of operations. So I could call this c1, I could call this c2, but I see how many times it happens, right? I have c3 times n, I have c4, and I have c5. Now, the question I have for you is, what kind of function does this give you? Starts with an L. What kind of function is this if I add up all the time here? It's linear. So this, is, this, uh, so this would be c1 plus c2 times n plus 1 plus c3 times n plus c4 plus c5. And so this would be my complexity function if I wanted to be very delicate with this. And as pointed out, this if you actually take a look at this, this is the this is a linear function. And one thing I want to point out for those that are just not convinced by this model, each of these constants, and this will come back next lecture when I get to this, each of these constants may represent how many operations that can occur on that actual computer. So you get to decide what these constants could look like. If you, for example, know that your computer say its addition operation takes some, some number of operations, that might be C1, it might be C2, if you're talking about how long it takes to execute that loop. I want to analyze this so that it doesn't matter what these constants are, I want to look at what happens with this input, what happens with the input size. So these constants could actually represent how many operations those, these guys over here take. The point is, is that we're trying to do this in a machine independent way, and you might know that this algorithm takes big O of n time. Notice that the part that dominates this function is not the constants, it's these n terms over here. So that being said, I'm going to get you to take a look in the notes. I'm going to show you that you can just count the different kinds of operations. In addition, I'm also going to give you another example with insertion sort, showing you how you can count the operations. In addition, I'm also going to give you some, uh, some tricks for counting these operations so it's a lot less work. Okay, so I apologize for going a bit longer here. When we come back, we'll start talking a bit more about how all this comes together, okay? So I'll say thank you very much, and have a beautiful day. I'll see you later.